about 20 years ago or so, I remember reading a book that had nothing to do with conspiracies. It was actually a very innocent personal finance book by Robert Kiyosaki. I'm sure a lot of our listeners read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He actually described the Illuminati in that book. What is your definition of the Illuminati, Jim? Well, it has changed and probably will continue to change. Um, but what's, what surprised me is once I got into researching the Illuminati is that I've heard all the conspiracy theories and the, and the claims, you know, oh, they're behind everything. You know, you, you can't get a plumber on the weekend. It's because of the Illuminati, you know. And there's always, and I thought, well, you know, that's hyperbole. That's just, they're blowing stuff out of proportion. Yeah. They they don't really understand that the world is just kind of a messy place and stuff happens, you know, blah, blah, blah. But i got to tell you, Mel, after more than a year of investigating and based on 50 years of research, uh, yes, there really are a handful of people, if they are people, and that's another whole issue, who are trying to rule the world. And they do it, uh, they started off thousands of years ago. This is nothing new. This goes all the way back to uh, probably uh, the first global civilization, which uh, some people refer to as Atlantis. But uh, we don't know much about that, so we'll let that go. We'll bring it forward to the Sumerian uh, civilization, the civilization that arose in Sumer, S-U-M-E-R, which was uh, located between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers over in the Middle East, uh, and today is one of the few places on the world that we can't just freely travel to, and that's Iraq, okay? And in Iraq, uh, for for thousands of years, nobody even knew about the Sumerians, and uh, and yet, in the mid 1800s, they began to investigate these strange mounds of rubble in Iraq, and they discovered an entire civilization there. And as they have now put it together, it shows that this was an incredibly uh, technologically advanced civilization um, uh, that far exceeds uh, anything we thought of at that time period. Uh, predates the Egyptians by a few thousand years. And in fact, the Egyptian civilization, I know when I was a kid, we were kind of taught in school that the Egyptian civilization was the world's first greatest civilization, but it turns out it was simply a degraded version of the Sumerian civilization. And and uh, where did it come from? Well, you know, we actually were told that. We're told that in the Bible. Uh, it came from Abraham. Okay, whose original name was Abram, or, or the wise one, the knowledgeable one. And he came from Ur of Chaldea. Well, Chaldea was just a biblical name for uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq. And Ur was one of the major cities of the Sumerian civilization. And uh, they had such an advanced knowledge of astronomy and of... Uh, agriculture and of political government, language, mathematics, you know, that it's absolutely incredible. In fact, we're, we're still using their mathematical system based on uh, the basic uh, 60, a uh, 60 number. And we're still using what they found uh, in their astronomy. We're still using their agriculture methods. In fact, uh, I was kind of <laughs> interested to find out that the Ancient Sumerians even recorded that they had four types of beer. <laughs> and uh, I, I bet one of them was not light. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, uh, but you know, and that, that shows that they had something really going for them. They had, they had some way of learning this information because wine, I can understand. You know, a caveman finds some uh, grapes on the, on the ground that's been there, and they ferment it a few days. And, He's hungry, he eats them, and he gets a little buzz, and he decides, hey, this is cool. So he learns how to ferment grapes and stomp them and make grape wine, you know, and make wine. But uh, beer? Beer requires a formula. Beer requires hops and malts and, and sugar, and you have to just put it in just the proper ingredients, and it has to be done just in its way, and it has to be fermented. And, you know, it, it's a formula. How, how did they learn that? Well, 
that and all of the other miraculous things that they had, they, they're they open about it. They say they learned it from the Anunnaki. Well, who's the Anunnaki? Well, that translates as those who came from the heavens and landed on the earth. <laughs> okay, ancient astronauts, if you will. And, of course, there's a lot of people still poo-pooing that, but I want to tell you the evidence around the world is uh, quite compelling, if not overwhelming. And, of course, you have scholars uh, such as uh, Zachary Zichin and, and many others who are supporting the uh, contention of the uh, journalist uh, Eric von uh, Dannigan. Yeah, who, you know, wrote back in the 70s, he said the evidence points to ancient astronauts, uh, you know, these people that came from the stars and landed here and uh, manipulated things on the Earth. And this is exactly what the Sumerians wrote down. In fact, it's really interesting, Mel. The story of the Anunnaki is actually told in the Encyclopedia Britannica. The, uh, the translations uh, have not really seriously been argued with. It's just the interpretation. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, you find them under Sumerian myth. In other words, they were just stories made up by the Sumerians. But a growing number of people, led by Sitchin and others, say, no, <laughs> it wasn't just something they were making up. This is what they stated, and this is what they meant. You know, when they said these people could fly through the air, and they landed and taught them how to do things, um, they weren't just making up stories. And uh, so from there we go on and we find out that, uh, you know, kingdoms arose, empires arose. And these people connected to in the Anunnaki, of course, they uh, pretty soon they're in the situation of Charlton Heston. <laughs> they're on the planet of the apes, okay. But they don't want to be just another ape. They, uh, they know they came from somewhere else and they know that they have knowledge. So they, uh, there's a whole story there of how they uh, tweaked the DNA of Earth primitives, and uh, that's why there's no missing link between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon, because they had their DNA uh, tampered with. And uh, that then came, of course, jumped right straight to Cro-Magnon or modern man. And so don't get the idea and don't let people tell you that we're created by aliens. That's not right. But they did tweak us. They improved the breed, just like we do with animals, with dogs and cats and sheep, cows, horses. We breed them for the traits that we want. Well, you know, we do it through breeding programs. They did it through DNA manipulation because they had such an advanced technology. Well, pretty soon, uh, they just, there were so many humans, and they they didn't really want to have to rub elbows with all of us, so they created a, uh, a cast of people in between who would uh, act as surrogates for uh, what was quickly becoming the gods. Because these ancient people, they see people fly through the air and they see that they're able to grow things, they're able to, to write, they're able to do all kinds of things, and they go, wow, these must be gods. And uh, the Anunnaki, after a period of time, decided that wasn't such a bad thing. But they didn't want to have to deal with us personally, so they uh, set up a uh, representative system, a caste system, if you will, or a priesthood. And since that time, they have uh, kept the human race conquered, divided, fighting with each other, and under tight control through two primary methods. One is religion. Because these priesthoods that they created began to set up their own systems and call each of these Anunnaki their own gods. And then finally they got to where they said, okay, okay, it's only one god, but it's always an amalgamation of all the other gods. And of course, uh, throughout history, we've learned about the gods, uh, the Roman gods, the Greek gods. Uh, and what's really fascinating is that... Um, once you get past uh, the name changes, the uh, the characteristics of these gods were so similar as to probably be identifications of the same entity, the same person. Uh, for example, um, in the Sumerian, the uh, the uh, Anunnaki who was put in charge of this planet of the Earth was Enlil, 
Well, in the Egyptian mythology, it's Set. In Greek, it's Zeus. And in the Roman, it's Jupiter. But they both fit the same characteristics. So they probably could be the very same person. His rival uh, in uh, the Sumerian was Marduk. In the Egyptian, it's Horus. In the Greek, it's Ares. And in the Roman, it's Mars. And so just the names changed, but the characteristics didn't. And I think all this refers back to these spacefarers, the Anunnaki. Now, this was a secret that was passed along through the priesthood. They knew it. They didn't tell everybody else about it because, after all, they represented God. God told me to tell you, here's how you're going to live, and here's how much you're going to contribute to the church. <laughs> you know, And it became a money-making and and power-wielding institution, and they didn't want to give that up. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I think you'll find this interesting. I sure did. The original Greek sky gods were called the Titans, and I, I, most people know that. But what they don't know is in the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, the word for those who live in the heavens is Titan. <laughs> So see how it all it, it, it all moves right along, and it's all uh, internally consistent. Well, so where did the knowledge of all this go? Well, it fell away from the average people. Only the priesthoods held it. And even within the priesthoods, they held held their knowledge of the sky gods and of the um, their technologies. Held it very close, and as the priesthoods began to split up, uh, they became different secret societies. Um, and we find that there was a uh, pretty good variety of them. Uh, and, and some of these we know, some of them we don't even know. But this information, this knowledge of the uh, of the ancient astronauts was passed down through such uh, organizations as the Rosh Hashanah, the Assassins, where the word assassin comes from, the, the Jewish Kabbalah, the Essenes, that apparently Jesus was... Uh, connected to because uh, in the Bible he uh, which has been heavily edited he criticizes and lambasts the Pharisees and the Sadducees the two major Jewish uh, uh, religious hierarchies at that time but it, it's, uh, it's suspiciously uh, you know devoid of any criticism of the Essenes which has led a lot of people to believe that he must have been one We've got the mystery schools of Egypt and Greece. We've got the Rosicrucians. And, of course, this knowledge was eventually passed down to the uh, legendary Knights Templars. And the Knights Templars brought it back to Europe. And from then on, it's just been, you know, uh, one religion after another and one schism after another. Uh, the Universal Church or the Catholic Church broke into uh, Catholic. Catholicism and, and uh, uh, the uh, Christianity. Christianity, Christianity, yeah, yeah, and uh, and then and then what we find is is really interesting because uh, and it's always money, and money has been connected to the church all the way back because the priesthood found out that uh, they could get rich in <laughs> telling people you got to give some money to the, to the church. And uh, plus, they became very powerful because they, uh, the Catholic Church, once they got created there uh, uh, in Rome and had the Roman Empire behind them, um, in every little village there was a priest, and you went and you confessed to the priest. So it was a modern-day NSA. <laughs> they knew everything about everybody. Right. Okay. Plus, they loaned money and gave uh, uh, their blessings to the uh rich and powerful and to the royalty and so basically it was the church during the middle ages that controlled everything and always money and wealth was tied inextricably uh, uh, with uh, the the, uh, the church in fact if you think about it the the prince of peace <laughs> jesus uh you know who always preached turn the other cheek uh, the one time he got pretty vicious <laughs> it was uh bankers when he threw it was yeah but it was the money changers, the bankers. And if you'll think about it, Mel, were, were they in a bank somewhere? No, they were in the temple. Okay, so it's religion and money tied together. Um, 
Manly P. Hall uh, was a uh, high-ranking Mason and a philosopher and had studied a great deal of this, and he pretty well laid it out. He says uh, in a pamphlet called uh, What the Ancient Wisdom Expects of Its Disciples, he says, in the remote past, the gods walked with men. Now, he's calling them gods. Uh, the evidence points to extraterrestrials, but it's just a matter of semantics, whatever you want to call them. They chose from among the sons of men the wisest and the truest, and these they labored with, preparing them to carry on the work of the gods after the spiritual hierarchies themselves had withdrawn uh, into the invisible worlds. And with these specially ordained and illumined sons, they left the keys of their great wisdom. These illumined ones founded what we know as the ancient mysteries. Okay? And as I said, these ancient mysteries split, and what they knew was that knowledge was all split and scattered among these uh, secret societies. So now there's just, as you see, if you've gone through my book, there's so much there. Uh, telling stories about how this came about, uh, how Solomon's treasure was recovered by the Nazis, uh, how the uh, uh, medieval alchemists were actually onto it. They knew about there was something about transmuting gold, about the white powder of gold, and, and monatomic gold. Of, yeah, yeah, the monatomic gold, and how that was probably produced by Moses, and this was what they used to uh, sustain the Israelites in their forty years in the. In the wilderness, because they had this white powder that they would um, make, you know, put, add water and make into a dough, and they'd bake it, and they'd eat it, and they, they said, "What is this?" And what is it in ancient Hebrew translates as manna. So this was the manna from heaven uh, about the Knights Templars, how they brought all the uh, information back to Europe, um, and uh, they were spreading it through their uh, the uh, Freemason. Uh, societies that they created, okay, the stonemasons, which soon became just the Freemasons, uh, and it was divided into spe- speculative, operative masonry, which was people who actually were stonemasons and worked with uh, uh, building, um, and then the speculative masonry, which was just the, out, the, the ones that were not involved, and that eventually grew to be the largest segment of Freemasonry. And Freemasonry also was founded by the Knights Templars. So this is the thread that kept this underground stream of knowledge rolling along. Now, the Illuminati comes in because it was founded by a student at Ingolstadt University in Germany, which was not Germany at that time. At that time, it was in Bavaria, and Bavaria was just one of many German states. Prussia? Yeah, yeah. Pr- Prussia uh, was one. Uh, um, I think he had uh, Baden, the, you had Saxony, uh, Hanover, uh, he had, uh, they were all separate. They didn't get uh, organized until about 1870, I believe. Are you talking about Adam Weishaupt? Yes, and Adam Weishaupt was a student at Ingolstadt University in the 1770s. And in 1776... The same year that we were writing the, the, the Declaration of Independence, he formed the, Illumin, uh, the Bavarian Order of the Illuminati. Uh, and so that's where the Illuminati got started. Now, here's what's interesting. They did not start off to be a overthrow of the government institution. What they were were a bunch of uh, college guys and to include some professors who were forward-thinking, progressives, we'd call them today. And interestingly enough, they smoked marijuana. <laughs> they had little parties where they had, and they invited women. They weren't uh, opposed to the opposite sex. And they had a think tank, a think talk sessions. We called them bull sessions back in college. Uh, in college, you know, you, you, if you're in a dorm particularly, and school's out, you've done your homework, and you're not ready to go to sleep, so you sit around, you have these sessions, you talk about the world, you talk about, you know, uh, the life in general and, and spiritual matters, things that happen, you know, what's going on, why are we here, where are we going? And uh, they finally decided that uh, the biggest problems in the whole back to the whole human race was religion and money, okay? 
and primarily the and and the royalty, the fact that that uh, the kings and the queens were running everything, central authority, and that uh, and that uh, religion, uh, the Jesuits who at that time were pretty much in charge of Bavaria, and what they said went. If they if you wrote something or said something they didn't like, you could get in big trouble. And we're kind of drifting back into that same kind of thing today. Um, and so they said, we need to do away with this. You know, we need to shatter these old structures of religion and of uh, power. And we need to bring out the best of the individual. Everyone should be free. Everyone should be foreign free. They should have equal and inalienable and inherit rights. And uh, if that sounds familiar, that's because George Washington and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, they all uh, knew uh, about this new Illuminati and they knew about these ideals because they had been pushed through during the Age of Enlightenment that the, we were coming into the latter stages of. And in fact, there are those who claim that Thomas Jefferson and Franklin and John Adams were uh, members of the Illuminati. And so they, uh, it was just a group that uh, decided they wanted freedom for the individual. And all this sounds real good, but just like, unfortunately, like so many isms, they, uh, and when I say ism, because uh, this is what I call what they were practicing, whether they were an actual, like Thomas Jefferson, whether, whether he was actually a card-carrying member of the Bavarian Illuminati is, is open to question, but there's no question in his writings that he adhered to their philosophies, right, which I call Illuminism, okay? And Illuminism is just like every other ism. Communism, capitalism, feminism, you name it. And it generally starts off with the best of intentions and the best of goals. But then it falls under the sway of the greedy and the powerful and the ambitious. And the first thing you know, it just, you know, we see this in the French Revolution. We see this in the Russian Revolution. And uh, that's the other thing. When you go back and you track it back, you find that uh, at the, the start, the beginning, the uh, cause of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, the National Socialist Revolution in Germany, the Nazis, they all were created by people who had been indoctrinated with Illuminism. So it was the Illuminati who was behind all of this. And they're behind what's going on today because there are so many people of what some people would term the new world order that are uh, practicing Illuminism. Um, Dick Cheney and Hillary Clinton. Now, everybody would think, well, they're on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And in many ways they are. But they both practice Illuminism. Because Illuminism's basic tenet is the end justifies the means, which means you can pretend to be anything, anybody. In fact, there are notes from the Illuminati to their members saying, you know, if you're Jewish and, and uh, you know, tell everybody you're a Christian. If you're a Christian and you want to be a Jewish, tell everybody you're Jewish. In other words, you can lie about anything. You can lie, steal, cheat, even kill if it justif if it's justified by your goal, by what you want to do. And that's what these people do, and that's what we see in operation today. You know, in inherently, individually, they may not be uh, bad, evil people, but they practice Illuminism. And uh, that has uh, caused so much problem, and it is behind all of the wars that we've seen over the past few hundred years. And it all ties back to money. And the money got started because as the Illuminati in Bavaria grew and in numbers and in belief by so many people, well, of course, this threatened the authority of the uh, the state. And so it was outlawed. Well, once it was outlawed, what are they going to do? Are they Are going to just fold up and go home? No. They roll themselves into Freemasonry. And they created the Order of Strict Observance. And pretty and the Freemasons, many of whom were already disposed towards individual liberty and freedom and the idea, you know, the ideals of the uh, Age of Enlightenment, uh, 
uh, they bought into it, and pretty soon the, it was the Illuminati that were behind uh, much of the push uh, of the uh, Freemasonic uh, orders, particularly in Europe. Now, in England, we had, I mean, in the United States, we had a little respite because in about 1830 or so, there was a uh, Mason called Captain Morgan who decided that he thought the Masons were being guided by other than noble principles and that they were being controlled by entities that he didn't think were uh, Christian. And so he was going to write a book revealing all of the Masonic secrets. Well, he and his publisher disappeared. Yeah. His fu- publisher finally uh, came came back, but uh, couldn't say much about what had happened, but he he never showed up again. And so obviously he was murdered. And the word got around that the Masons had done that because every time his family and his friends would go to the authorities, they found out the authorities were mostly Masons and that they would all cover for each other, which is part of their secret society. Even judges. Even judges, right on up. And uh, this created such a turmoil that uh, it created the first third party in the United States, the anti-Masonic party. Of course, you don't hear much about that today. And uh, But it really dealt a death blow to Freemasonry in the United States because their thousands of lodges dwindled down to a few hundred and their membership dwindled down. And it took them the rest of the 19th century to, uh, to try to regain their status. And today, of course, everybody just thinks of the Masons as oh, they said, you know, they drive funny cars and they and they uh, support uh, burn centers and they do all this good work and they're just, you know, community orientated people. And for the most part, that's true. But what people don't understand is, is that within Freemasonry, there's an outer circle and a tight inner circle. The outer circle doesn't even know the inner circle exists. That's why if you go up to a mason and say, hey, is there an outer circle and an inner circle? He's going to tell you no, because he's either a member of the outer circle, in which case he doesn't know and he's not told, or he's a member of the inner circle, in which you've taken a blood oath never to reveal that there is an inner circle. The reason we know there is is because some of the most high-ranking masons have admitted to that. Okay, In fact, one of the highest-ranking masons, General Albert Pike, even admitted that at the very top of the Freemasonry uh, chain uh, are the people who believe not in the uh, Adonai God that most of us do, but in Lucifer, the light bringer, which some people have uh, said is the devil, although I'm not sure that they actually mean the devil. But so there's just there's just so much going on there, and it's all behind the scenes. But and these are the ones who they say are trying to control the world. Well, well can you actually control the world? Well, yes, you can, because uh, in 2011, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology did a big study of 43,000 multinational corporations, and found that they were in. Uh, actually controlled by just a little over a thousand companies with interlocking ownership. And these thousand companies in turn are uh, pretty much controlled by about 150 corporations and these are controlled by 20 banks. And so now that is, ex- and all of this, uh, you know, uh, represents uh, more than 60% of the total worth of everything in the world. Now that is intense centralized financial control and this is uh this is where uh, the control comes from well, let me ask you this jim because you mentioned something interesting about these corporations i was thinking lately that if they really wanted to change politically create a new world order and all that maybe they could have done it earlier but it seems that they're transitioning from politics to corporatism and i mean yeah. The Trans Pacific Partnership. I'm talking about NAFTA. I'm talking about all these trades. Are they switching to trade agreements in order to control the world? Uh, the short answer is yes. And here's the deal, Mel. Prior to World War II, uh, and at the time the Bavarian Illuminati were active in the late 1700s, 
like I said, there wasn't even the nation of Germany. There was just a bunch of uh, German uh, states. Um, and so prior to World War II, we had these different states. We had the United States, we had England, uh, we had France and Germany. And within those national boundaries was a financial and religious system, systems, okay, R religion, banking, business, commerce. You know, you can break it all down, all the way down to steel, natural resources. And this is what they started off. This is how they were, where they were trying to gain control over there. And they did, the isms, the communism, uh, which came, grew out of a organization called the League of the Just, which was an Illumini, Illuminati organization. And they just changed their name to the Communist Party. So the Illuminati created communism in Russia. They created, and as a, uh, there were a lot of people who were opposed to that. And uh, they didn't want the Russians to run everything, so they created National Socialism in Germany, put Hitler in charge uh, as a block against the spread of communism. Here's another ism, Nazism, okay? And uh, then when he, th he got out of hand because he wasn't doing business with the international bankers, okay? And uh, the international bankers are the ones who've been manipulating this, but they've always, they always did it prior to World War II within the systems, within a national boundary, France, England, Germany, whatever. And uh, this was all the way up through World War I, where they, they got in a World War fight. But afterwards, the, uh, the system pretty much stayed the same. But now after World War II, these systems spread worldwide. So now instead of the New World Order trying to gain control over Germany or over England or over uh, America, the United States... Now, they're trying to gain control over them all. And that's why, because it's spread worldwide now, and that's why we have globalism. And global, the globalism is very real, and this is why they're trying to turn over all this power to the United Nations, such as Global 2000 and, you know, safe cities and all this stuff. You know, because the more centralized power they can get, the more they know they're uh, capable of gaining control over it. And trying to gain control over the world, that's been one of the uh, oldest ambitions ever recorded all the way back to Alexander the Great, all the way back to everybody wanted to be the king of the world, right? But the world's a big place, and they hadn't been able to technologically, communication-wise, transportation-wise, they haven't really been able to make that work until now. And now they're in a position to... Uh, I mean, if you go around, particularly at uh, Western Europe, uh, North America, China, Russia, okay, and you go and you go visit a middle class family, it's going to seem like the same. They got the same color TV made by made by Samsung. They got they're driving the same car made by Toyota. You know, it's the we're just coming we were becoming one total global. Uh, entity and uh, all of this stuff you see in the paper about oh Russia Russia messed with our election oh Russia's doing this and we're doing that and the ISIS is doing this ah, that's a dog and pony show that they're putting on for us just to keep us distracted while they uh, take over financially uh, religion is kind of on the wane uh, there there may be a new one if things get really really bad. Everybody's going to turn to religion. You're going to find either religion making a comeback or there'll be some new type of religious blend, you know, religion light <laughs> that, that everybody will go for. But right now, uh, everybody's pretty well split up and even the most radical uh, religious groups are kind of in the minority. And uh, you don't see the Catholic Church has lost so much of its power and and, and sway, and uh, so now it's uh, they're leaning on the financial. Uh, everything we have a whole uh, system, in the financial system in this country, and in most of the world, that's based on debt. <clears throat> if you have money, you have debt. If you have debt, and somebody controls you, because if you're buying a house or if you're uh, buying a condominium or uh, wherever you're living, if you're paying on it or if you're paying on your cars, if you're paying on your clothes and your TV, then 
the banker has control over you. You can't just quit your job and get up, go move to another state, and try something else, because you got bills to pay. And uh, and this has led to a really untenable situation, if you think about it, Mel, because we've got uh, the most consuming society ever in the history of the world. And to keep people consuming, you have to keep them dissatisfied. I mean, if you're satisfied, why do you want a new house? Why do you want a new car? Why do you want a new TV? I always have to have something new. And, you know, oh, we got we got the latest thing here. It's got enhanced color. Uh, it's bigger sized. You know, oh, yeah, you got to have that. So that puts us in this between the rock and the hard place because we are killing ourselves with pollution. Plus, plus you have planned obsolescence. Oh, yeah, of course, so that you have to go buy something. Right. Because that light bulb, that back in the 1920s when you bought a light bulb, it would last you a lifetime. And now, you you know, you can look on the package, it'll say 3,000 hours. It'll last you 3,000 hours, and then it's going to blow. Planned obsolescence. And unfortunately, the same goes true with our automobiles and our refrigerators and everything else because... uh, the corporations realize that if they make a quality product, it would simply last you for years and years and years. You won't be buying another one. And the whole idea is to buy more. So we're in a situation where the more we buy, the more we throw away, the more we throw away, the more we're killing ourselves with pollution, junk, trash, and air pollution, um, water pollution. Okay, well, so... What do we do about that? Well, we just have to stop consuming, okay? And that means, of course, that everybody have to wake up one morning and go, you know, I don't think I'm going to buy that new house. I don't think I'm going to buy that new car. Uh, I don't need a new TV. I can get along with the one I've got. And, of course, if everybody did that, if everybody stopped consuming, what would happen? The economy would collapse. And we'd all, we would all be doomed. So and when I say the rock and the hard place, we're doomed if we keep consuming at rates that we're doing right now. And we're doomed if we stop. What you said about religion, perhaps a, a one world religion, you probably heard that in the past few months, a lot of high power people, I'm talking about people from, from, from religions, people from, from governments, uh, uh, even uh, what's his name, uh, Buzz Aldrin, they all went to Antarctica. I don't know if you've heard about this, but the information I'm getting, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But they found some ancient artifacts down there showing that there were people way before that had their own religion. And perhaps they want to bring that religion now to make it the one world religion they've been waiting for. Have you heard about this? I've heard that. I don't know that. The problem is we don't know what's going on down in Antarctica. We know that it's a very mysterious place. There's lots of mysterious stuff happening down there, and we just hear bits and snatches of it. And, and Mel, this actually kind of gets back to my major complaint and gripe because I'm from the media, okay? I trained and graduated with a degree in journalism. I'm a journalist. Uh, I was taught to look for the truth, tell the truth to your readers, you know, as, as best you can find it. And that's what I've tried to do my whole career. But there is no news media anymore. Uh, there's only various propaganda wings, okay? And they're only telling us what the corporations want us to hear and what the government wants to hear. And the government, by the way, in case you hadn't figured it out, is owned by the corporation. You know, it's a corporatocracy or, or uh, better yet, uh, it's it's fascism. And I use that term advisedly because the term fascism is uh, generally said was coined by uh, uh, Franco. Vito Mus- well, I'm sorry, uh, Mussolini. Yeah, yeah, Mussolini, the Italian dictator in World War II, because of his black-shirted fascistas. And by the way, where that came from, Mel, is uh, they wore those black shirts and they wore that emblem of the axe tied in a bundle of sticks. Okay, that was an old Roman signal uh, symbol. And the fascist of Mussolini adopted it because it represents central government, okay? The axe can tie it amongst the sticks. The sticks can always be chopped up by the axe. And so it represented a strong central government. And so they were known as fascist. So that's where the term fascism comes from. But Mussolini himself said that that may not be the right term. He said a more correct term is corporatism whoa right 
Did he see it coming or what? Absolutely. And I heard this lately. What is it? Uh, capitalism with that. What is it? Capitalism with with without fascism. Gosh, what is it again? Capitalism without socialism becomes communism. And capital. Anyway, I don't want to confuse. No, wait, wait, no, wait, OK, well, let's see. Capitalism without socialism or no, with socialism would become communism. But no, the opposite. Back. Capitalism without socialism becomes com uh, I'm sorry. Socialism without capitalism becomes communism. Okay. All right. And the other part is that I'm not remembering now. <laughs> is uh, socialism without capitalism <laughs> becomes Nazism. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you have given us an overview of all of this stuff and the book, folks, Every time I read a book from Jim Mars, you know, I'm, I'm always expecting the best, and he just tops it every time. But I want to just dig deeper now. For example, you know, if so many politicians, Jim, have been referring to the Illuminati, perhaps, you know, using different names, uh, take the late New York City mayor, John F. Hyland, 1922, he said, he said, quote, the real menace of our republic is the invisible government, which like a giant octopus, which sprawls its slimy length over our city, state, and nation. At the head of this octopus are the Rockefeller Standard Oil interests and a small group of powerful banking houses, generally referred to as the international bankers, who virtually run the U.S. government for their own selfish purposes, unquote. Now, you find similar quotes all the time. Why wasn't anything done? Is it because they hold most positions of power today, Jim? Yes, yes. It's the same reason that I, I, you know, I know people and I have worked for uh, companies uh, that's a structure, you know, and you realize there's something wrong at the top. But number two, if you want to keep your job, you don't say anything about it, except, you know, whispering at the water cooler. Uh, you know, who, who are, it's the rule. It's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> And uh, everyone, the, the higher you go in the political spectrum or the corporate spectrum, the more uh, yes men you find. And they do not want to go against it. And this goes all the way back. This goes all the way back even into the universities. Uh, let's say you, you want to be a, you're really fascinated and you want to be a history teacher, okay? So you go to the university and you take the history courses. And uh, I'll tell you my, one of my own personal experiences. Um, I was had a history course in college, and they, well, I got a test. And the, on the test, the professor says, "What do you think are the four major causes of World War II?" Well, I wrote down my paper, and I handed it in, and I got it back, and it gave me a D. <laughs> okay, I almost flunked it, and I went up and said, "You know, what's with this? Why did you grade me down?" He said, "Well, because," and he goes and starts going into it. And I realized that he had phrased the question wrong. He asked me what I thought was the four causes of World War II. What he wanted was what he told me the four causes of World War II was. I was simply supposed to repeat back to him what he had said. Well, I'd already done my own studies on World War II, and I had my own ideas about it. So needless to say, I didn't do well in that class. And if I had, you know, if I had stuck with that and gone on to be, try to be a, a fellow or a, a student teacher in the history department, I probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere and they wouldn't have, you know, it, you, they, all higher education does is teach you to conform, uh, to the current uh, paradigm. And if you're outside that, then you don't go, you know, you drop out, you go somewhere else, you change your major. Okay, and that, so it starts all the way back there, and by the time you go through biz, Harvard Business School, then you're thoroughly indoctrinated with their view of how everything works. I'll give you another example. I once, in, way back in the 70s, I was interviewing an energy expert, and at that time I'd gotten real fascinated with the idea of solar energy because to me it seemed like that would be the way to go. You know, it's, it does not produce, uh, you know, harmful chemicals and gases and all kinds of pollution and and if the sun goes out well we're all in trouble anyway so you know why not go for solar 
And I uh, saw so this energy expert, and I'm asking him more about solar. And first off, he says, well, oh, yeah, very condescendingly. Well, that's all fine and good, he said, but uh, solar power, that that's 20 years in the future. Well, excuse me, here we are, 20 years in the future, and we still don't have abundant solar energy. It's there, but it's expensive, and only a handful of people can really make the use of it. But then he explains why, and he says, do you realize that it would take uh, the entire state of Arizona covered with solar panels to generate enough power to power the city of Los Angeles. And I'm young and naive, and I go, oh, okay. And I go off, and I'm thinking about that. And that's probably true, uh, you know. But then I suddenly think, wait a minute, where's the flaw in his thinking? The flaw is he was taught and educated and could only think in terms of central generation. you got to generate that enough power and then ship it and send it to Los Angeles so you can send a bill to everybody, okay? What if everybody in Los Angeles puts solar panels on their roof? You know, nothing's going to change. It's not going to interfere with their home. And yet they, there's, they've got the, their own power in themselves, and, and they're not going to have to pay the electric company each month. Or wireless energy. I mean, that's Tesla. Exactly. And what happened to Tesla? Exactly. They put him down and excavated him and then stole all his stuff, and then they're still hiding a lot of it away under national security. Because, And the reason for that is because of the power companies, and they have so much uh, power, <laughs> political power. And because, uh, you know, they, they haven't figured out a way that if they went to solar and you had solar panels on your roof and you didn't pay your electric bill, they, they hadn't figured out a way to make a cloud come hang over your house. Now, let me ask you this, as we're talking about oil. I, I recently interviewed someone who researched that the Titanic and the Hindenburg disasters were related all because they were a threat to the oil industry. What do you what do you know about that? Well, I, th I think that's absolutely true in the in the uh, case of the Hindenburg. Uh, and the Hindenburg, uh, you know, when the Hindenburg blew up and was captured on newsreels and it just went everywhere and became a major event, that pretty well put the death knell on uh, various alternative for forms of energy. Uh, and, and the thing is, if you dig into it, you find out that uh, that that was not just uh, that was a conspiracy. The United States refused to, and we say the United States. See, we'd have to dig and find out specifically what individuals are involved. But I would bet you anything that you would find people high ranking in the oil industry, and they refused to sell uh, helium. Uh, we had a huge helium plant just not right here in Texas, but they were, and it was non-combustible. But they refused to sell that to the uh, Germans. The embargo, and embargoed them and made them use hydrogen. Yeah, and uh, and uh, hydrogen, by the way, today is making a comeback with just a little bit of tweaking on your uh, car's carburetor. You could run your car on hydrogen, which is uh, you know is not flammable. Uh, and it's not polluting, you know, and now it is flammable, but it can, but it can be controlled. And uh, we could be using a hydrogen economy, but there again, Hindenburg, everybody thinks hydrogen and think explosion. So, uh, you know, uh, that's kept that going. And so in that case, I think you're right. Now, the uh, Titanic, uh, I'm, I'm not real sure how that would, how would that affect uh The coal. Oil industry. It was a coal industry at the time. Coal was everywhere. Yeah. So, but you how take, would sinking a ship impact the coal industry? Well, no. Uh, after the Titanic, then the engines were changed all to use oil. Oh, I see. O on the ship. Exactly. The ship coal. Yeah, okay, I got it. Exactly. I, uh, okay, that's possible. That might be another uh, nail in the coffin, another straw that broke the camel's back. I think uh, I think the main purpose on the uh, sinking the Titanic was, number one, is insurance. If you go study, it really wasn't even the Titanic that sunk. It was uh, uh, it's The Britannic or the Olympic? Olympic? The Olympia, yeah, Olympic, yeah. And, but then uh, there was another reason on top of that. Some of the most powerful, wealthy people 
um, the Astors, and I think it was the Astors, and others in this country were on board and lost their lives. And these, uh, interestingly enough... They were against the Fed, the Federal Reserve. They, they, were, they were the very people who were opposed to the Federal Reserve System. Yeah, I tend to think that was probably the major cause. But then, they, you know, anything they, anytime they can loop things together, I mean, like the Kennedy assassination, you know, it wasn't just that he was going to pull us out of Vietnam. And it wasn't just that he was going to curtail the power of the Federal Reserve System. And it wasn't just the fact that he was prosecution, uh, organized crime, or, or, yeah, or threatening to do away with the CIA. It was just that combination. You got it all together. You got all those people thinking something's got to be done about this. And so when he gets killed, nobody says anything. They just go along with the, uh, with the uh, false narrative that's presented to us. By the way, I found what I was saying before. You cannot have socialism without capitalism or it becomes communism. But you cannot have capitalism without socialism or it becomes fascism. Yeah, there you go. And, and, that's, and that's very true. And that's why, you know, we talk against socialism in this country all the time, and yet we have, you know, look at uh, uh, Social Security, uh, look at Medicare, look at, you know, we got all kinds of social Exactly. On, you know, and, and I think that the trick is to hit a balance. I need to write that down, really. repeat that back to me. That was a good one. We can agree that you cannot have socialism without capitalism, or it becomes communism. But you cannot have capitalism without socialism, or it becomes fascism. Fashion. And by the way, folks, I'm saying this. That doesn't mean I'm a socialist, <laughs> just because right. I'm reading this. But anyway, I'm looking here, uh, thinking of the me mechanism used to control humanity. Uh, there are plenty of these under two main umbrellas. You, you mentioned them. Again, is it religion and finance? Are these the two top controlling mechanisms over humanity? They have been in the past. Uh, today, uh, religion is waning somewhat, although it's still very strong and still impacts a lot of people. If a lot of people are, are, are convinced that something's ungodly, then they're against it. And they're going to be against it, okay? So, yes, basically that's still going on. But today, the key thing, I think the key uh, social mechanism is money. Uh, you know, everything, everything's money. Everything's tied to money. And there are those, I mean, whole movies have been made about people who, you know, they're bank robbers and they do, they'll do anything. They got to get money, you know. But you know what? I'm looking at how in the past, you know, countries would get into war to conquer land, conquer resources. And I'm looking at China, for example. They don't have to even drop a bomb here. They're buying Hollywood. <laughs> And they're changing the culture. And they basically, if you look at some of the movies, it's almost like China is a paradise. And by the way, I'm not demonizing China, but I don't like the fact that they're changing our culture this way by taking over the Hollywood studios. That's true. In fact, I've told people before, I said, uh, don't, don't look for a Chinese soldier to show up at your doorstep. He says, it's going to be a guy in a business suit. He's going to have a piece of paper. And he says, here. I own this place now. Get out. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, as of the yeah. day of the recording of this interview, the Bilderberg Group is meeting in Virginia. Today, folks, is the Bilderberg Group a branch of the Illuminati, Jim? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, number one, all of the members of the Bilderberg Group are not Illuminati, and some of them may even be good folks. But there is an inner core. Uh, and also, a lot of the people who attend the Bilderberg are not the decision makers they're just representatives okay and uh and this gets back kind of to the corporate leadership uh you know, let's say you got the guy who's making 50 million dollars a year as ceo of some giant multinational corporation yeah you know is he a uh, new world order uh, illuminati tool well not consciously okay he may be a perfectly okay guy but he is the top administrator. He does not really make the decisions. He simply sees that the corporation operates in a uh, productive and profitable manner. And uh, chances are he's got a Harvard Business School degree, okay? 
and he may be a perfectly okay guy, but he has to answer to his board of directors, who has to answer to the chairman, uh, who has to answer to the major stockholder. And this is where a lot of people get confused because a lot of people think that to have the uh, controlling stock of, say, some big corporation, you have to have more than 51%. Well, that's not true. Uh, you know, if everybody, if no one owns more than 3% of uh, the stock in that company and you own 4%, you're the majority stockholder. And what you say goes, this is how they control these corporations. And they send their representatives to Bilderberg so that they can talk out and get the word on what the new policies and what the new programs are going to be and what they should support and what they should not support. I would love to have heard them uh, at uh, last year's Bilderberg and see uh, how they were talking up. Okay, you know, uh, Hillary's going to be president. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, if that if that was what was said, it could have been. In some of those back rooms, they're going, okay, you know, we're all going to talk up Hillary, but uh, we're going to put Trump in. Because <laughs> he certainly has uh, acted in their behalf in many instances. Wait, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Because obviously anybody who's going to be selected, even as a candidate, has to be going through the filter of the Illuminati. I, I have no doubt about that. Exactly. But then again, Trump is reversing some of his standings during the the election cycle at the same time i see him getting us out of tpp i see him getting us yeah. out of the paris agreement which by the way a lot of people are just complaining about that but to me that's nothing but a 15 trillion dollar carbon tax exactly and and what they want to do is reduce co2 that uh, you know if we got rid of all the co2 this world would be a dead planet no trees. I mean, does, does, does nobody does nobody understand that trees and plants and us depend on CO two for life? You know. In fact, I was already I'm already upset about the way here in Texas they're just building and building and building. You know, I don't know where they think everybody's coming from. I guess from California, they're fleeing the state. But uh, uh, and and they come in. I see this out here because I'm out in rural Texas. They come out here and they get a nice pretty patch of land and the first thing these builders do is go in there and bulldoze all the trees and then do they chop them all up and and let people come and either buy or, or give them firewood you know for the winter no they just put them up in big piles and burn them now they're polluting the air and they're killing all the trees what the hell's with that and that's going on and plus all the other deprivations against our environment and now they want to come around and tax us you know, for CO2, you know, which is life-giving. That's what we have to have. That's what trees and grass thrive on. They are, And we'd all be healthier if there was more CO2. So, see, everything's just topsy-turvy and the idiots are in charge. And, and people don't question that. What I just said, no, I, know, I, I, I know people. They watch, because they watch TV. Yes, yes. They watch TV. And the TV is the biggest mind control mechanism ever devised and it's all under the control of five corporations everything you see in here and that's not just tv that's radio that's uh except maybe for mel veritas <laughs> <laughs> every year when i talk to you that number goes down one by the way yeah yeah exactly and and they control everything you see in here. And that's not just news. Uh, that's uh, uh, entertainment. That's content. That's movies, uh, records, uh, records, tapes, discs, whatever they're putting music on these days, uh, and uh, 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 magazines, billboards, you name it. Everything you see in here is under the control of just a handful of corporations, and they are all owned by interlocking directorships. I was very, very impressed with the fact that you included in the book. Let me just find my, my notes here. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Uh, I didn't expect it, but it seems you didn't leave any stone unturned, uh, Jim. You say, quote, on a bizarre, bizarre note, even today's music scene may be the product of a pre-World War II Nazi Illuminati plan to change music to replace tranquility and harmony with discontent and aggressiveness, unquote. I'm so glad you mentioned this in the book. Can you summarize for those who are listening the transition from 4, 4, 430 to hertz to 440 hertz? The, the concert p 
pitch, the the uh, uh, tuning frequency change, and for what reason? Right. Well, uh, yeah, without going in a long uh, rigmarole, uh, throughout history, uh, most music has been tuned uh, to a note uh, at, uh, what is it, what I put there, three, three, four, 432. It used to be 432, four that's 430. 430. 432. Okay, and at that tone, that tone is a very homogenous tone, and uh, they use that tone when they're testing plants and stuff. If you play music that's tuned to the uh, 432 uh, hertz uh, tone, uh, the plants tend to lean towards the speaker. You know, they they love it and they thrive. Okay, well, they found that if you up it some, you go up to 400 uh, hertz. Uh, this is a jarring. Uh, has a jarring effect on on life, plant life. Plants uh, that are put in a room with uh, 440, which is, uh, you know, 432 has been throughout history. They they found ancient lutes uh, played in ancient Egypt and places, and they're they're at at 432. But when you go to 440, it's uh, it produces a kind of a disharmony. And it's very aggressive. And and today, classical most classical music is in 432. But if you go to um, heavy metal banging or head you know, head banging, uh, some some forms of rock, not all, but some, they that's put it up in the 440 or 400 hertz, which is very discordant and creates disharmony, dissatisfaction, agitation, you know. And uh, this, the Nazis found out about this in World War, uh, but prior to just prior to World War II, and they found that that's why all the Nazis were marching to these big marching bands, and they were playing at the 440, and it got people riled up, and you know, let's go march and let's go conquer the world, and got them into that framework, frame, mind framework, and it was done by a guy uh, who uh, uh, had uh, developed all this. Uh, and realized that this is what they needed, and that's why he was able to persuade the world music associations to shift for, uh, to this 440 hertz tone, which we are still uh, using today. That would probably help us out a whole lot if we just had music that was soothing and pleasant. I'm not, I'm not talking about elevator music that will put you to sleep, but but just stuff that's uh, on a little bit higher tone than uh, what we're getting. But, of course, again, that gets back to we're consuming society, and a consuming society can't perpetuate itself if everybody's in harmony and living in peace and, and feeling pretty contented about themselves and the world. I asked years ago the uh, director of the Tucson Symphony about this, and I asked him, can you tell me what frequency you use for, for tuning? And he said 440. And he thought that that was the only... Frequency that existed. He he, he, he didn't. That was it. Yeah, he yeah, thought that was it. it. And then I started looking into this, and now I have a piece of software that I've recommended to my listeners all the time. You know, all the classical music that you listen to these days is at 440. Now, if you put say a CD or a tape or an eight track or whatever into this piece of software that I have, now you listen at 432. I mean, you know who Jay Whitener is, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I sent Jay this, and he couldn't believe it. He called me, and he said, Mel, I cried. I actually cried by the feelings that I got from the music now. So, right. obviously, to me, this is beyond being discontent, being uneasy. This ease, stress, all that stuff leads to one thing, sickness. And I think if we all went back to that 432, it would keep us even healthy. Yeah. Hey, now, what what do you got? Is it a disc? What does it do? It's a piece of software. I'll send it to you if you want me to. Please the- <laughs> do. Please do, because I always like, I listen mostly to classical music anyway, and you're probably right. What I'm probably listening to is is, for, is at the 400. Four, uh, four, uh, 440. 440. I would love to get it at the 432. I'm going to also send you the a, a, a portion of that interview I did with them. At the end of that interview, I included some you know pieces of classical music before and after, so you could. Some people who have a better ear can really sense the difference, but most people cannot. Only your body can. Hmm. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, interesting. Now I have to ask you about Antarctica again. 
So do you think that something is going on down there that we're not aware of? Absolutely. But just don't ask me what it is because we're unaware of it. They won't tell us what's going on down there. Uh, the one thing that I do know is that, you know, the Vatican has built a telescope down there. We have our own big, huge, one of our biggest telescopes down there, and I think that that may have something to do with the whole idea of this uh, planetary body uh, called uh, Planet X or Nibiru or whatever, and uh, it it's, uh, supposedly will be coming in within, you know, within sight at some uh, near future date, and if it does, they say it'll be coming in from the, you'll be able to see it first from the southern hemisphere. So I'm thinking that they're just down there getting ready to uh, keep track of that. By the way, speaking of because telescopes. That, hey, but wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Mel, along with that, there is obviously climate change going on. There's something that's affecting the environment on this planet. You know, ice things are melting and things are heating up and blah, blah, blah. But sorry, uh, Al Gore, it's not our SUVs, okay? Because <laughs> right. whatever's going on, Mel, is solar system wide. The sun is acting a little funny. It's not. It's not doing. It's not following its usual routine. The uh, uh, the ice caps on Mars are diminishing. That means they're melting. The uh, the some of the moons of Jupiter, the ice is melting. Uh, Jupiter, there's things happening on that that we maybe they have SUVs there. Maybe so. Maybe that's it. Just a lot of, a lot of Jupiter SUVs, and then the outer planets are becoming more luminescent. So anyway, the point is, whatever is happening, this is solar system wide. Now, what could be impacting the whole solar system? Well, the only thing I can think of is Nibiru or whatever that is, some planetary body, or maybe that some people say it's a small, a miniature solar system. But anyway, whatever it is, it's on an elliptical orbit that takes it uh, around the Earth every, uh, what is it, uh, 3,600 years, something like that, and that it's nearing, uh, it's approaching now, and that we may be able to see it in the not-too-distant future, and that every time it comes by, it causes uh, disruption within the solar system. And, uh, you know, this could account for all of the erratic uh, weather that we're having, and it could also, going back through history, account for some of the great disasters like the Great Flood and blah, 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 things like that. By the way, we exceeded uh, the, the first hour. We have to take one and only break. How can people buy the Illuminati, the secret society that hijacked the world before we come back after the break, Jim? How can people buy the book and all your other great books? Uh, well, you can go to my website, jimmars.com. That's Mars with two R's. Uh, you can go to any bookstore uh, and, of course, Amazon. Excellent, folks. This is a fascinating interview with Jim Mars, the Illuminati, the secret society that hijacked the world. I have tons and tons of notes here of things that I want to discuss when we come back to dig deeper. This is Mel Fabregas, and you are listening to Veritas. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for listening to part one of this very important Veritas interview. To listen to the rest, head on over to the member section or subscribe at VeritasRadio.com. You don't want to miss the rest. Don't forget to visit the Veritas store where you can find great products like pure organic sulfur, rebounders, turmeric, and other great supplements. Thank you.